I, I will talk about today some results, some compactness results that I we did during my PhD with my former advisor, Professor Tomarcos and Professor Rapkin. Jesse, there is here in the audience. And we did that in the end of the PhD. So uh, it is not part of my thesis, but it is in archive. I'll, I'll give the, the link later as well. So this is this work in collaboration with Professor Joe Marcos and, and Jesse, as I mentioned. I will, I will start with some outline of what I meant to do today. So I first would like to say a few words about conformal geometry and describe, talk about the Yamaha problem. Then I, I want to go into more detail on the, the focus of the talk, which is the Q curvature problem. I'll, I'll set up our objective today. Then I'll describe some tools we use in the proof of the main theorem, which is the, the LNA metric and the Pohojev invariant. Then I'll describe our compactness result. I'll try to give a, an idea of the proof. And then I'll finish with some further, further research in open problems related to the main topic. OK, so the Yamaha problem is probably one of the most famous problems in differential geometry. And to understand it, we need the, the following definition. So if you consider a, a closed Riemannian manifold that is compact and without boundary, and here we're going to require the dimension to be bigger than 3 because, because of the, the growth we're going to need on the equation. So a metric is said to be conformal to a background metric that I'm going to call G0. If you can find a conformal factor, which is a, a positive smooth function on the manifold, such that you can write the, the new metric as this product. So we're going to denote like that to, to say that G belongs to the conformal class of G0. G and in this, in this sense, the Yamaha problem is a type of geometrization theorem and asks as follows. So if you have a given Riemannian closed manifold, it, you can always find a conformal metric that is that has constant scalar curvature. Okay, the there is a, a analytical way of seeing this problem. If, if if you write your conformal factor particularly like this, there's a a smooth function to this power, you can you can show that as a, a simple computation that finding a conformal metric with this constant scalar curvature is equivalent to find a positive smooth solution to this geometric PD. And here, the, this operator in the left-hand side, it's called the conformal Laplacian, and it has the, the curvature as its zero order term. The, the, the main point here in this equation is, is what makes this harder is that in the right hand side, because of this particular choice of power, what you get is a, a critical is a critical nonlinearity. So in critical by critical I mean in the in the global sense. Here this two star is it's actually two n over n minus two. So because of this it took a long time to people to solve that problem. Um, it, there is this really geometric motivation to this that you get to the CDE is that if you relate the, the scalar curvature of two conformal metrics, then in this in this transformation law, what it appears is the conformal of flashes. So this this explains why that CDE is related to comparing to prescribing the scalar curvature problem. And as I've mentioned, this is a Really difficult problem because it is in the borderline of the PDE because of the critical power on the right hand side. And it took over 24 years and a lot of efforts of Yamabe, Kroeniger, Obama, and Shane to solve that problem. And it was actually the first critical semilinear PDE to be fully understood. And at that time, also, the Yamaha problem solving, finding these best metrics with 
with constant scale of curvature was the was seen as the first step to solve the Poincaré conjecture, which was later solved by using the Ricci fold. Okay, um, after understanding this problem in a compact manifold, it is natural to wonder whether you can also find a, a best metric in the non-compact case. If you assume further that your non-compact manifold is k-ended, that I'll show later what it means, uh, you can use what is called the developing map, and you can reduce finding a conformal metric to finding again a positive smooth solution to this CDE. But now we have something else. You have a singular set that is going to be, in this case, a set with k points, and k is going to be equal to the number of n. And in this case, you're going to ask to the solution to blow up near the singular set. So you can you can reduce again the finding the geometrical problem on, of finding a best metric in a conformal class to find a positive solution to a geometric PD. But in this case, you have you have that solution should be singular near the this closed set. Okay, this is what I mean by a k-ended manifold. In this case, you have a three all all of those are three-ended manifolds. Okay, there is a more geometrical formulation of seeing this this problem, and is the following: If you define the, if you consider the space of all metrics, and you you furnish it with the gram of house of distance, you can define the following, which is called moduli space. I'm gonna call this y g naught. It's gonna be all the metrics that are conformal to this metric G0 and having uh, a prescribed scalar curvature. And this is a number that I'm going to show right here. It's just it's chosen to be the, the scalar curvature of the round sphere. So in the singular setting, you can also define this modular space. But in this case, you are in the sphere. So you are just searching metrics. They are they are smooth on the sphere. They are conformal to the round sphere, the standard one in the done by stereograph projecting the standard Euclidean metric. And but you you also must assume that G is complete on the on the complementary of this closed set. And this is why we we require the solutions to be blowing up near the singular set. It's because of completeness. So in this case, showing that you can find solutions to the classical or to the singular MR problem is equivalent to say that this moduli space is non is non-trivial. So this is the the, the, the formulation. Um, the first result in this line, for instance, you can show that this singular moduli space using a very classical result of Caffarella Gitter and Struck, you can show that this this the space is sequentially compact. Um, proving that this space is not empty was actually done a little bit further by Moselle in Pacar, and it's a little bit harder also. Okay, the, the matter of compactness when you are in, not in the singular set, it's even surprising what you have. If you have a manifold that is not, that is not conformally equivalent to the round sphere, the compactness results holds in this particular dimension, 3 to 24. And this is by Shane, Drewelli, and Jang, Brando, Curry, Marx, and Chain. And also, you can also disprove that that compactness results for dimension bigger than, than 20, 25, for instance. So this is a sharp. Uh, about this, the, the singular moduli space, you can also give more information not just that it's not empty and you have some sort of compactness, you can also show that it is a k-dimensional differential manifold and you can furnish with some coordinates somehow. Okay, this is what I had to say about the second order problem. Now I, I want to introduce, uh, I want to go further and study higher order EMF problems. Okay, again, in a Riemannian manifold, I'll, I'll ask it to be closest 
And now, because I have fourth order, I'll also ask the dimension to be bigger than five. We can define a, a fourth order notion of curvature. And this is the expression. So it involves the, the Laplace Beltrami of the scalar curvature, the norm of the reach tensor, and the, the square of the, the, the scalar curvature. And what I want you to observe is that because the scalar curvature is a second order, it is a nonlinear second order operator on the metric, and this operator is second order on the scalar curvature. This operator is actually fourth order on the metric and extremely nonlinear. But again, there is this, this notion of curvature associated to it, and it makes sense to ask all sort of questions that you had in the EMAP set. Okay, this dimension, this constant here will be just depending on the dimension and it will not be actually important in the, in the rest of the talk and they are explicit. There is a very explicit formula for them, but it's not gonna be important, so I'll forget. Okay, the, again, as we did to the scalar curvature, if you have this Q curvature, you wanna, you wanna ask how does this operator behave under conformal changes of the metric. So if you have two conformal metrics, and again, you're gonna write it in a very particular way, you have this transformation law. So what I'm saying is you can compare the Q curvature of two conformal metrics, but you need this operator here. This operator is what is called the panic operator, and it is conformal invariant, and this is actually the conformal invariant version of the flat malaplacian, which is not conformal invariant in RF. And it's given by this somehow ugly expression, but what you what you, you really need to pay attention in is that the leading order is the flat by Laplacian, is the is the by, by Laplace Beltrami operator, and the zero order term is the Q curvature. So it, it really resembles the, the conformal Laplacian. This is the fourth order equivalent of the conformal Laplacian. And again, you can ask the the Q curvature problem, which is just the version of the EMF problem to this type of curvature. So in a given Riemannian manifold, can we find a new conformal metric with constant Q curvature? And even this, this let's say, simple question, it's open. I mean, there are some partial answers that I'm gonna I'm gonna talk a, a little bit more specific later. But uh, I mean, it's it's too open to give that answer. Okay, again, you can do a lot of computations and show that this is equivalent. There is a, a PDE associated to it, a nice ellipse geometric fourth order PDE, and finding metric in this with this property is actually equivalent to find positive solutions to this PDE. Here again, you're going to face the problem of criticality um, because of the power in the right hand side. And this constant here is just based on the the Q curvature of the round sphere, and it it can be neglected. I mean, it's not important at all. Okay, the after talking about what is the Q curvature problem, we can again have a singular version of this problem, which is like that. So you have the problem in the round sphere. You have a singular set lambda that again is going to be a set of k points and you have your solution is blowing up near the singular set and so in in this case the tenet operator has this expression here it it's a little bit easier to to work with than the general tenet operator for a general method so again we turn the problem of finding a q cover to metric a constant Q curvature metric conform, conformal to the background metric in a non compact manifold to solving this singular geometric PDE. Okay, uh, the geometrical formulation of the problem is to define the, the following moduli space. So, the, this first moduli space is going to be the metrics that are conformal to G0, the background metric. 
the Q curvature is prescribed to be equal to Qn, which is again a geometric constant. And uh, but now we need to do we need some we need some hypothesis. We need the the scalar curvature to be non-negative, and this this will be important for for instance for existing results. Uh, in the singular setting, we define the modular space like that. So we have the metric in the in the sphere. They are conformally to the round metric, complete in this set, prescribed equal to this constant, and but now again with non-negative scalar curvature. And this constant is dimensional and given by this is just the, the Q curvature of the round metric. And again, the, the problem of existence, compactness, and everything related to the equation, it, it translated to information about this modular space and vice versa. OK, as I've mentioned, even to solve this problem, to solve the geometric PD, is not totally accomplished. There is this article of Gursky and Malchiotti, where they have this assumption in the scalar curvature to be non-negative and the Q curvature to be semi-positive. And in these conditions, they can solve the problem. So this is a partial answer. And there is this weaker one of Hang and Yang where they change the, the scalar curvature condition by just assuming that the EMAB invariant is strictly positive. So in those settings, the the Q coverage problem is solved, but in the remaining cases, it's totally open. The compactness is also a huge problem because you have results for low dimension, five to seven, and then you have counter examples to dimensions bigger than 25, and you don't know if the this eight to 24 is actually the, I mean, you can prove again compact. This is still open. The other thing that is open is the studying the compactness of the singular space in the sphere with round metric. And this is in red because this is what we're gonna focus. This is where we this is what we wanna talk about. These other two ones, they me they certainly are hotter than the this one. But let's see. Okay, the now I can I can set up what are our objectives. So I have this modular space of metrics that are conformal to the round metric and singular at this set. And I want to show that this set is sequentially compact. OK, the statement precisely is the following. If you take a sequence of metrics that are uniformly bound, you want to find a, a limit up to the six. It's just the the definition of compactness that everybody knows. You can also reformulate this in terms of the conformal factors. So taking the matrix is equivalent to taking solutions, a sequence of solutions to the geometric singular PDE, and you have some a priori bound. You want to take a subsequence and show that it converges to the to some limit. Okay, to do that. To show that compactness, I'm going to need some tools. So first tool is going to be the Delaunay metric. This metric will be somehow the models near each singularity. OK, the, the way you understand it, if you do a stereograph projection, you're going to see that near each point, each singular point, your equation will look like a, a PDE on our end. A, a singular PDE in this punctured ball, but in this left hand side, you have no geometry. You have the flat vial of logic. So, what I'm saying is, understanding these local models will be equivalent to understanding what happens to metrics near the, the poles. And the, if, if you look at very small scales or of large scales, what you actually want to do is to understand what happens near the, the origin, this, this singularity. You want to, you want, you need to blow up the picture and you need to look at this blow up limit problem, this entire PDE in the punctured space. 
And so there is some there, there were some results in the literature to this to classifying and studying the local behavior for those cities, but some of them are even new. Okay, the what is really important in understanding the 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 results is the this so-called logarithm cylindrical change of variables. So the way you do that, you're gonna take a new function that's gonna be it's gonna be v depending on t and theta, and you're gonna take with this power this very particular and specific power n minus four over two, and t is gonna be the logarithm of the radius. And if you do a lot of computation, what this transformation does is that you will arrive with a nicer city in a cylinder and somehow the city is nicer because the pan x operator in this new cylindrical logarithmic system has this expression it is a a partial a fourth order partial derivative on the time variable and then you have this whole polynomial but it you have constant coefficient, so somehow there is a, a plus here. This is a typo, but somehow it, it is a nice operator. And you can look at this also geometrically. So what you're doing is somehow you're writing your metric with respect to the cylindrical standard metric, and then you also arrive in this PD. So what we're doing, what we're saying is that you have a singular PD in the contrast ball. And then you use some sort of coordinates on which this PD looks nice, looks nice. And so I can state the main results concerning the these these models, these flat models. Let's say like this. So to the blow up limit problem, so this delta zero in the notation it stands for the Euclidean metric, and this infinity says that you are in the blow up limit situation in the contrast space. So if you have an entire solution to that critical PDE, that critical fourth order PDE, this one, actually this one here in the in the whole space, you can actually classify all the solutions. This is this is remarkable. If the origin is a removable singularity, you have this kind of solution. You got you have an X one, an X X zero, and all solutions will have this this form. If you have a singularity, you can also say which are the solutions, and they will look like a this power, this this blowing up term times a nice bounded periodic solution to this initial value problem. So it's basically going to be the a blow a singular term times a nice solution to a fourth order PDE, a fourth order ODE with constant coefficient. And that's why I said that the operator in cylindrical coordinates looks really nice. It's just a constant coefficient ODE with, okay, there is this bad known array, but it's, I mean, at least you can, you can do like some, you can try to use some standard methods like phase plane analysis and choke it theory and, you know, this other kind of stuff. Okay, the, the coefficients are given as I've said, it, they are explicitly, they depend on the dimension and they are given like that. Okay, based on this theorem, you, we have two definitions. The solutions that are not singular, the, they are called bubbles or sparkles, and we call x0 and epsilon the center and the next side. And also the metrics that are induced by this conformal factor will have the same name. They are be called, they will be called spherical metrics. The, in the singular setting, these, these solutions will be called the Delaunay solution, and the parameters will be the period and the next size. And this next size will be really important for the, the, the main statement of the talk. Again, the metric will be called the Delaunay metric, and the, the limit, when you, when you make the epsilon go to the epsilon n, this bounded limit, you're going to have the cylindrical metric. Okay, so this is actually a picture of the the phase plane of the ODE, but I want to pay attention that there is there is a lot going on here because you have a fourth order ODE, so you would expect to have a four dimensional uh, space 
analysis or the, your ODE, but you can actually show that because of the coefficients, because of the nature of the ODE, those solutions will behave like second order, like in the second order case. So you only have a two parameter family and everything is, at least at this point, is nicer because you can just recover the, the classification you have for equilibrium point in the, in the two dimensional case. And this is somehow the, the idea behind this picture. So here you have the, the models. I, I want to remember that solutions are symmetric. So if you look at the one dimensional profile and you rotate it, you have all the, the solutions. And here in red, you have the solutions that I call bubbles or spherical. They are not blowing up. Then in blue, you have this blow up profile, let's say. And then in red, you have those periodic orbits, which will be just solutions that are bounded and periodic, and they are blowing up at this specific rate at the origin. And this is the, after you rotate it, this is the picture. Okay, if you translate to the metric, this is what you're doing when you're taking this, this Delaunay family. You're transforming a cylinder until the singular limit, which is called the, the feral, the, I forgot the, the name of the singular limit. And the, there is this, this degenerate situation that, okay, we, this is not geometrical. You can see that in the ODE, but this is somehow the picture. Okay, the local behavior is that after you classify all the, these blow up limit solutions, what you can say, and this was done by Jian Xiang, and after by, by Jesse and myself and Professor John Marcos, that if you have a smooth positive singular, and here you need the, the super harmonicity condition to this local equation, what you can say is that the solution is asymptotic for it's always symmetric. And even moreover, it is asymptotic and you can control the rate of asymptotic. This is a very geometrical argument to the Delaunay solution. So if you look at geometrically, what you say is that if you take a metric in the moduli space, and if you look in the small scale near each single area, you're gonna see a Delaunay metric. So asymptotic, each metric in this conformal class is Delaunay. So it has this nice model. Okay, the Pohojev invariant, it's maybe the most important ingredient in the proof one of them, but maybe the, the most important. And it is really common to have those kind of invariants in PD. The one I'm gonna speak today is just a particular case of a more general class of invariants. But okay, the, this, whole, this whole analysis is easier in the cylindrical setting. That's why I introduced that change of coordinates. So in the cylindrical setting, you know that you somehow have a ODE. You have an ODE in a cylinder and you have some, some you know, angular terms, but you can integrate and you can define this Hamiltonian energy. So if you differentiate that with respect to T, you're gonna see that solutions will satisfy that this is zero. So somehow you have a conserved energy for your problem. And this is the definition. So since we have this, this conserved energy, if you integrate this, this Hamiltonian over the angular variable, you're gonna find a, what is called a N invariant. And it's gonna be the cylindrical Pohojev invariant. And what you have is that this invariant actually will, will classify whether solutions can be, can have removable or non-removable singularities at those at the origin first. Okay, the it, it, what I'm saying is the following. You can you can use you have a notion of Pohojev invariant for cylindrical solutions, but you can you can associate this notion for metrics in the following way. You know that near if you are in a singularity, your metric will look like a Delaunay metric. So you can associate you can call the the Pohojev invariant at that puncture 
you're going to say that it's going to be the Forogev invariant of the asymptotic development method. So that's how you use this, this cylindrical invariant to define an invariant for each metric and at, at each function. And this is the definition. So if you take a metric in the conformal class, we're going to define what is called the radial Forogev invariant like this. It's going to be just the cylindrical Forogev invariant of the asymptotic Delaunay metric. Um, okay, for people in PDE, especially in fourth quarter PDE, there is this more, this, this expression has more a, I mean, looks like more a Forogev invariant that comes from the, the, the classical method of Forogev of integrating and find it in a PDE, and it looks like this. Uh, the, our remark at, is that we don't need actually to work with this expression, because what is actually important in the classification is the sign of the Pohojev invariant. And we can show that the cylindrical, the spherical, and the geometrical one, they all have the same sign, and they are related. So this is just for curiosity that you have a you have an expression of this invariant in terms of the original U defining the punctured ball. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, this invariant is well defined because the the time derivative of the Forget, the cylindrical Forget invariant is zero, and that's just uh, we we use we integrate it by part to define this invariant in in that manner. And as I've also mentioned, you have this relation between those invariants. So the sign will be the same of each one. And so it doesn't matter the expression. We only need the sign. And you can also show that the Pohojev invariant of the spherical solution is zero. And the Pohojev invariant of all the, all the other solutions are actually negative. So this is actually saying what I've mentioned that the sign of this invariant is detecting the whether solutions can can blow up or not near the isolated singularity. And the the main conclusion of this of this section is the following: is that the the Pohojev invariant is controlled in this is is more is determined by the next size. So the next size of a Delaunay metric fully determines the, the Pohojev invariant. In the following sense, you have that they are, they will only depend on each other at each point, and they will increase to, to this limit, which will be zero, when the epsilon i goes to the, to the epsilon i of the spherical metric. So the, the, the way this result is important is that at a certain point, we're gonna be, asking information about the next sizes, but we're actually going to use information about the Pohojev invariant. But it doesn't matter because they are determined by each other. OK, as I mentioned in the beginning, this is just a particular case of a further more rich class of geometric invariant. And it is related to this, this very old observation of matter that if you have a PD or a, a even a differential equation with symmetry, you have a you have conserved energy, you have conserved quantities associated, and the Pohojev invariant is just a way of detecting those quantities. So there is a general way of defining of using this structure of the sphere, more precisely the conformal Keeling vector fields of the sphere. You, you, this is the Lie, you can take the Lie algebra and you can define the Pohojev invariant just a, an element of the dual of this Lie algebra. It's a very general idea in geometry and PDE. In our case, the, the Pohojev invariant, if you want to look at very in the complete sense, it's kind of complicated because it is the, you have an, an integrand. You have an integral always. The Pohojev invariant is going to be like an integral invariant, but the integrand is a very complicated tensor, which is the eisen lovelock tensor that appears in supergravity and conformal conformal gravity. Okay, in the in the language of in in this language that I introduced, this radial Pohojev invariant that I define it using only the cylindrical equation 
is just a particular choice of conformal killing vector fields on the sphere, and it but it's sufficient to the applications we wanna we wanna give today. Okay, I finally can can state our main results, our compactness results. But for this, I want to recall again the, the moduli space we are considering. So remember, we have metrics on the sphere. They are conformal to the standard metric, so they are conformally flat. They are complete outside this closed set, which is just P1 and PK, have eight points. You're going to need to ask the scalar curvature to be non-negative, non and you prescribe the, the Q curvature. So inside this space, we're going to define another space. If you have delta 1 and delta 2, positive is small numbers, you're going to define the following subset. So you're going to take metrics in this, in this set above, and you're going to ask the, the distance between the functures to be controlled by delta 1, and the next sizes, the next sizes of the asymptotic Delaunay metric to be bounded by delta 2. So what I'm saying basically is that I don't want the points to be close to each other. I want to, I don't want them to collapse. I want to, I want them to be somehow apart, controlled apart. And I, I don't want the next size also to collapse. I want to, I want them to be bounded. So in this, I will furnish Again, those settings with the Gromov house of distance, which is just a, a notion for the ones that never heard about, is just the notion of distance between metric spaces. So we're looking at the manifold with a G1 metric. We look at the, the manifold as a G2 metric, as a metric space, and then we're looking at the distance as metric space. And we're furnishing this set with this topology. So what we can say is the following, very shortly. If k is bigger than 3, then this set that I just defined is sequentially compact with this topology I have introduced. I can even say that just with words, and is the following. If the next size of asymptotic Delaunay metric is bounded away from 0, then the space of complete conformally constant Q curvature metric with no negative scalar curvature will finally puncture its spheres with at least three distinct points it's sequentially compact with respect to the Gromov house of topology. So this is stated here, it's just this sentence. And, and I'll explain why we need all those, I mean, we need the, the cardinality of the singular set to be bigger or equal than three. We need the, this bound on the distance between the points and we need the, this bound on the next sizes. And with that, we can show compact. Okay, the remark is that, uh, as I mentioned, we, we, we did this statement to the next sizes, but we can, we could also do the statement to the Pohajev invariant. And it's what, what, it's actually what we use, but as we've seen, they are determined by each other, so it doesn't matter if you take one and not the other. And in the, in the Pollock paper, which does the same for the scalar mm -hmm. curvature, the assumption is on the on the on the Pohjev invariant. Okay, uh, the other thing, if you look in the paper, it it's gonna be done in a slightly more general setting. I mean, the our singular set, the, it's not fixed. It, we only ask the singular set to have this cardinality equal k, and then you you're gonna call it this unmarked modular space, and then again you can you can do I mean. It, the, the proof is it's similar up to some, some remarks. And why 3? Because the case is, okay, k0 and k1 is given by a result of CS wing, 80, 98. And k2 is a very recent result of Frank Honiga and says that the moduli space is just half an interval, the semi-open semi interval. And okay, the for k bigger than three, you have our our result of compactness. The condition on the scalar curvature, as we mentioned, is because we we want to have proper harmonicity, and this is actually important because in the fourth order setting, a lot of a lot of ideas are are um, failed because of the lack of maximum principle and the superharmonicity of the of the Laplacian is 
it's a way of somehow getting getting you know of of fixing this problem okay i can finally give some words on the on the proof and uh, the proof is basically given by two estimates two a priori estimates and then a, a somehow standard compactness argument so the the first estimate is an upper bound estimate and says the following if you have a metric in the conformal class i mean is the same of have of having a solution to the geometric dd the singular geometric dd you can say that near the the singular set your solution is it controlled by this this power here this behavior here so and this constant doesn't depend only depends on the dimension okay the the, the idea of this is a fairly standard blow up analysis if you're going to take a blow up sequence then you're going to take the limit of this blow up sequence and you're going to converge to a somehow noun problem which is classified all solutions are classified and using that you, you know that solutions are classified you can show that the boundary of large balls will be mean 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 concave but this is a contradiction because an earlier result of Alex Chang uh Jane Chao Hang and and Po Yang says that this boundary should be mean convex and this is a contradiction so our blow, blow up sequence doesn't exist and uh, the estimate holds the second step we need to use, and this is this is, this is maybe finer, says that again a metric in the conformal class. If you look at the conformal factor, you're gonna have a a, a lower bound like that. And in this case, the constant will depend on the on the on the solution either, not not only on the dimension. The way you do that, and here is important, it's using the sign of the radio for Hojev invariant in a removable singularity classification. So if you suppose that this constant doesn't exist, you can take the limit and you can, you could show that the for Hojev invariant at some singular point is going to be zero. But it can happen because in this case, solution should have a removable singularity at the origin and they wouldn't be, the metric wouldn't be complete. So this is a contradiction. This is somehow, this is actually based on G and Xiong resulted, I mean, you just had to reread it, but this is the state. With those statements, the proof goes like you take a sequence of metrics in our space, which are you can denote like that. Then you this is equivalent, as I mentioned a lot of times, to take a conformal a sequence of conformal factors in C for alpha. And then by the upper bound, you have that this sequence is, is you have a uniform bound for this sequence. Then you you free to use Arzella Astoli to to extract a limit of the subsequence. And the uh, the really difficult part is to show that this limit is not trivial. So if you suppose that this limit is is trivial, you can use a Hanark inequality. And again, the hypothesis on the Fourier invariant to be away from zero to show that the solution is non trivial. You you can generate a contradiction. By studying the the asymptotic rate of the green function of the penates operator near poles, so if you use that very smartly, you can generate a contradiction and show that solutions are actually non-trivial. And it just you, it's remaining to prove that the metrics is, are complete. And the way you do that is to use the lower bound axiom. And again, the fact that if your Fourier invariant goes to zero. So what, what is actually happening is that your solution is not being singular and this is a contradiction. And so in this way, you can prove that your space is compact. You can find this, this, this limit. And this limit, this candidate that we found is actually the, the limit we were searching. I, okay, I've, we, we've studied this modular space and we, we showed compactness in a certain subset. But the, the main point and the great question is whether this 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 modular space is, is non trivial and this is a this is a ongoing project with Paisa, Professor Jean Marcos, Jesse Almir, 
And to show that actually this, this space is non trivial, and you have actually a whole family of solutions in, in this space. We, we, we actually want to do more. We want to show that this space is a differential manifold, and the dimension is actually equal to the number of points. This is a slightly hard project, but we also want to show that this is related. And again, if you, 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 you want to go, you want to, you want to go further the, the conformally flat case, right? You want to go, you want to consider metrics that are not the round metrics. So you can also define this singular inhomogeneous moduli space in the same way. And, and here you're just describing the, the, the Q curvature, but you have a general manifold. And as, I mentioned studying the, the properties of this moduli space is just equivalent to studying the properties of solutions to this geometric pity. This, but now you have the full the, the full penate operator here, so this is this is slightly or or uh, a lot more hard. So the, the point is it can also be proved again with some condition on the biotensor, and this is this is I mean this is on preparation. Is really close. If the if you take not all background metrics, but if you take a background metric with some properties, and then I'll say what properties are, the moduli space, even in the inhomogeneous case, is not empty. And more precisely, you can you have the whole family of Delaunay metrics you can construct from the Delaunay metrics inside. And the conditions here are specifically. That you need some control on the bio to some order, and the order is given like by like that. And you need the metric to be non-degenerate. And in this situation, you can prove that the this 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 moduli space is not empty. But there is a lot more to do. These are, these are the open questions. I mean, first you need to show that the asymptotic models does they they don't change when you go to the case with geometry, the inhomogeneous case. This is this is expected to be true at least for low dimension, five to seven. And compactness, the, in the same way we did here, the inhomogeneous moduli space, it would be interesting. And also, if one can, uh, giving some differential structure. Um, the other stuff is that this program is done just for point singularities. I mean, the, the singular set is P1 to PK, but you can also think about um, a, a singular set with higher dimension, and you, you could want to extend this, this program to this situation. And some of it, at least the existence, the, the existing case, it was proven by, by higher star in this very recent hypo to 21. So I think I, I, I'm going to stop here. This is everything that I, I would like to cover. I want to thank everybody for. Time and attention, and I'll, I'll be pretty happy to ask questions in your comments. Thank you, Bob.